This evening we have a subject that is almost certain to become controversial. So I'm going to ask you to think as quietly and carefully as you can and see if perhaps some of the points that I want to make are really more obvious than you might first imagine. You must give a certain background to this discussion because actually most of our concepts of demonism, black magic, witchcraft, and diabolism belong to long traditional concepts and beliefs which have endured in our way of life over thousands of years. First of all, I think we should make one rather important uh, differentiation. Most of the demons of antiquity were comparatively respectable creatures. Uh, the ancients be believed that there were in nature spirits both good and bad. Good spirits they called gods, or in uh, nature worship, kami, or elemental beings. Evil spirits they regarded as more spiteful and malicious by their natural intention. And these two orders of invisibles were used to explain a variety of natural phenomena. When things went well with man, he was grateful to his gods. And when things went badly, he propitiated his devils. For he assumed at an early time, and apparently quite sensibly, that God and the subordinate deities that attended the Supreme Being could not be the cause of evil. Yet as a mortal physical creature, man experienced certain disasters which he called evil. He found himself plagued with circumstances destructive to his happiness, his health, and even his life. He had to explain how it was that a good God ruling over a good world uh, could produce destructive situations. To meet this need, orders of beings subordinate to deities, but still by nature malicious, were conjured into reality. Perhaps man copied this concept in turn from his own associates in this world. He discovered what we all find, that some of our associates are nice people and some prove treacherous or destructive. Some of our friends are faithful and others faithless. It appears that uh, certain phases or aspects of our way of life are protective and others are destructive. And today we explain these differences on moral or ethical or cultural or legal grounds, but still we are faced by these two parallel lines of occurrences, one helpful and the other hurtful. Going back over the history of primitive demonism, we note that nearly all of the so-called destructive forces were regarded as entities in themselves. They were sprites or mysterious little beings 
of nature capricious and malicious. But they operated almost completely according to their own natures. Uh, they afflicted or burdened people because apparently they enjoyed doing these things. Irish folklore is full of mischievous uh, beings who seem to like to play pranks on innocent mortals. Most of these older demons, therefore, were an order of life, just in the same way that the uh, various Greek divinities originated in some region of their own, had their own way of life, and only occasionally came into contact with mankind. Uh, this contact could also often be altered. Malicious spirits could be made at least temporarily friendly by offerings and by various gifts and by propitiations, as they were called. It did not seem to occur to these older peoples that these spirits were other than what they seemed to, than they seemed to be, some kind of a hierarchy of entities inhabiting their own worlds and coming in contact with man only on very rare occasions. The second type of spirit that was regarded as hurtful or harmful was the individual who died with great evil or great hate in his heart. If we wronged someone terribly and he died, we conceived that he might haunt us. Uh, perhaps this haunting was mostly the voice of our own conscience. We may have realized that this person went out of this world injured by us, and that perhaps had he a survival after death, he might resent this injury and continue to avenge it from the other world as he might have liked to do it from here. So we have this kind of uh, spirit being, the souls of the unhappy dead. This more or less ex exhausted the Greek concept. The Greeks were never particularly devoted to demonology. Uh, they kind of liked life. They enjoyed nature. Uh, their religion was a rather buoyant, festive kind. They would much rather uh, uh, live in a world filled with good spirits than with evil ones. Our word demon, however, has been derived from the Greek. But in the Greek form, daemon, it did not signify an evil being at all. It simply represented a creature from another dimension who might have some contact with earthy affairs. Socrates had a demon, according to his own records. And this was a godlike creature who warned him of impending evil and harm and protected him on many occasions through life. So the Greek concept of the daemon was very little different from their concept of the demigod, except perhaps that the daemon was a little more uh, available, was present upon requirement more definitely and more uh, consistently. We have practically no records among the Greeks, for instance, that they ever tried to use one of their spirits to harm any other person. These spirits were protectors and guardians and friends, but there were orders of spirits that were by nature inclined to be malicious or meddlesome, but the Greeks generally handled those rather successfully by putting out a little bowl of food or offering a prayer or making some little promise that they would do a favor for the spirit if the spirit would be kindly to them. It was rather a childish state of affairs and never got very much beyond that point. Among Oriental nations, there is an elaborate study of demonism of all kinds. But I rather suspect that we have been somewhat uh, over-influenced by missionary reports. I think the demonism of Asia was very much like that of Greece. 
Uh, I know that uh, today, in, far, in Asiatic countries, uh, there is very little fear of evil spirits, even where they are believed in. Uh, they are not regarded as being particularly dangerous. Japan has its little oni, its little goblins, but if you want to get goblins out of the house for uh, the year, all you have to do is throw some beans at them at the Setsibon Festival, and they depart for the rest of the year. They're really not very tenacious or especially difficult. I saw a book of uh, Japanese paintings not long ago called Recreations of Hell. It was a delightful little thing which would indicate that the oni or spirits were more or less unionized or something of that nature, and that in their spare time they went fishing, had picnics, and gathered in some quiet bamboo grove and drank sake together. This seemed to be about their principal activity. Now, in almost all countries where Buddhism has been introduced, we have the same consistent story, namely that the Buddhist teachers immediately uh, converted the demons. Demons just didn't have a chance uh, where uh, Buddhist missionaries went out. Even in Tibet, when Padma Sambhava uh, converted the country, he, he converted all of the evil spirits, and they all became good Buddhists, and they became servants of righteousness ever after. The only function that was left to them was the right to just groan and grumble a little bit and perform just a few little uh, examples of their uh, powers in order to sort of frighten people back on the straight and narrow road again. Uh, they became helpers who... Um, uh, whose only remaining function was to warn people against being bad. Now, this situation also seems to follow in many other parts of the world. China has supposed, has supposed to have had more demons than all the firecrackers in Asia could frighten away. But again, these demons did not seem to be particularly ferocious. We have many representations in painting and carving of the most horrible scenes of demons uh, punishing lost souls. But no one really seemed to pay much attention to it. And there's no indication that it improved the virtue of the people to any appreciable degree. Uh, these uh, ideas just didn't sink in. The native at attitude just was not appropriate to it. Uh, the, uh, the general way of life was essentially, um, well, you can't say happy exactly, because many of these people were miserably underprivileged. At least we may say that the general temper was optimistic. Uh, people wanted to believe that good things would happen not only in this world, but the world to come. And they also had a, a deep conviction that whatever their religion was, that, actu that their prayers and their, con their mantrams and their various teachings would ensure them against being very deeply plagued by any sinister force. In none of these older countries do we find a kind of demonism in which the demon can stand against God. There is, no, there is no possibility of rebellion on this level. The demon is a nuisance, principally, represented as perhaps having some minor right to plague unfortunate humans, but even the demon himself rather inclined to repent of his evil ways and uh, depart with very slight encouragement. Actually, I think the Chinese, most of these people, were more afraid of ghosts than they were of demons. Uh, our philosophy in the West, however, seems to have from the beginning developed a rather neurotic attitude on this subject. Uh, in both the Old and New Testament, uh, demonology seems to play a very real and significant part. And then uh, as we went along through time, particularly in the Dark Ages, uh, demons became a very terrible sources of negative belief. Uh, they, they plagued everybody. 
uh, the um, early Christian missionaries enlarged the population of the infernal region by populating it with all the pagans and all their divinities. This made it a rather congested area. Furthermore, uh, the, the early church uh, developed some very aggressive attitudes about how easy it was for a human being to lose his soul. He hardly had to do anything except miss one mass and he was in trouble. <laughs> Evil was ever nigh unto him, as St. Paul tells us, and he meant it, and he meant it uh, very literally. And because of this, we see in the Western civilization, all the way from the Mediterranean to Ireland, and all the way from the southern tip of Sicily to the most Nordic lands, uh, this very great fear, this almost neurotic pressure in which the individual lived in an almost constant terror of some weird and terrible force. Here again, however, most of the uh, pattern was firmly set upon uh, what might be called demonism in its classical sense. The demon punished sin. The demons didn't bother good people. They had no reason to. But they had a strange and immediate power over sinners. Uh, it would almost seem as though deity had assigned them the right to do this. And that whenever a person broke the good rules, he was subject to the uh, punishments and afflictions and burdens uh, that uh, the demons uh, would administer as the agents of divine wrath or punishment. Uh, the church, however, had its ups and downs on the subject of demonism. Altogether, I think we can say that the general trend of early Christianity was against demonism. It existed, it existed very strongly in local areas. It uh, raised considerable trouble and confusion from time to time. But every once in a while, something that was either common sense or a clearer vision of things would always step in and clear the situation for a while. I think that we can say that the demonism as it was popularly practiced even in Europe was never really according to the church canons. It was simply something that local peoples, especially the ignorant, the peasants, and the um, fearful, the neurotic, the psychotic um, developed and uh, which the clergy in turn tried to exorcise with holy water and uh, church candles. Uh, the the um, attitude was periodically to clear this atmosphere and to uh, not allow the concept of demonism uh, to build too strongly in the early church history. Wherever it did build, wherever we had waves of this, we had also waves of incredible cruelty we had a horrible disasters, um, largely the result of morbid imagination. Now, every nation, every people of the world has produced neurotics of some kind. They're an inevitable part of life. Certainly, they are more abundant uh, where the li pressures of life have a tendency to become abnormal. But there's always someone uh, to whom uh, healthy, natural, optimistic matters have no, uh, have no meaning. There are always people who live and brood and feel and fear and worry and hate and fuss and maintain jealous, negative attitudes toward each other. Such persons have always existed everywhere in the history of our race. So, there have always been psychotics. And today the psychotic presents very much the same problem that he did 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. The difference now is 
that he is operating against a background that is not nearly as credulous as it was in the early times. Uh, when a psychotic today uh, sees um, horrible and uh, destructive visions, uh, this doesn't become the basis of another witchcraft outbreak. It simply now means that this person is judged to be uh, mentally ill. A few hundred years ago, he was not so judged. He could be taken to the steps of the church and exorcised. If he did not recover, he might be subject to torture. If he still did not uh, mend his ways or, in, or repent his uh, claims or pretensions, he might well be burned at the stake. Uh, this situation uh, does not hold today because we simply have a different attitude toward it. But back 1,500 years ago, when Europe was comparatively illiterate, when almost nothing was known of mental medicine, uh, the hysterical person, uh, the uh, uh, unbalanced individual, the psychotic, uh, was an object of the greatest fear. Uh, in uh, different areas, of course, uh, this also differed. Among the Greeks, an insane person was said to be under the protection of the gods and was therefore never injured or, or bothered in any way. But in Europe during the Dark Ages, any person mentally unbalanced was assumed to be possessed of an evil spirit. Something had to be done to get this evil spirit out. And as we know, in most psychotic cases, there is a distinct lowering of the ethical moral threshold, the individual becoming abusive and profane and even animalistic as a result of mental sickness. It is easy to understand why uh, older nations felt that this person had suddenly become inhabited by some very low and malevolent being. We don't want to labor this phase of the matter too much, but we do know that in the subconscious of our people, in the subconscious of the race, all these old beliefs still lurk. Uh, we are, even now, unless we are completely materialistic in our attitudes, a little inclined to wonder, to question, to suspect that perhaps some of these old beliefs had validity. Perhaps somewhere around there is something that does have uh, a forked tail and horns that might cause embarrassment at some moment. This, uh, this belief, because it has come down to us, and because it has survived in many primitive areas of society, even today, uh, requires or suggests considerable thought. First of all, we know that in modern society, demonism as it was practiced or held to be true in ancient times is now almost totally reserved uh, to so-called backward peoples. Uh, it is uh, still largely found in isolated, underprivileged areas. It is found among people who are comparatively illiterate, whose advantages in life have been few, who have been strongly introverted into patterns in which their tribe or their family or their community has been spirit-ridden and ghost-ridden for ages. Uh, it does not appear too often in what might be termed a, a level of higher uh, mental attainment. It is limited to primitive areas which should give us some idea as to the real state of the matter. Now, in more modern times, during what has been called the uh, Middle Ages, there appeared another uh, problem that uh, really does not stem from real, honest, good old-fashioned, constructive demonism. It is, it is a, a different brand of this belief, and it has been called diabolism. Uh, and diabolism, or black magic, as uh, it has gradually come to be known, uh, indicates or holds the concept 
that of two things. First, that evil spirits naturally existing can be controlled or brought into the service of a magician, as in the case of Faust, and that this uh, evil spirit will do the bidding of his master for a certain length of time, sign a pact with him, perhaps sign it in blood, in the European museums and libraries, there are a number of these original packs, neatly signed in blood. These packs bound an evil spirit to man for a time. Usually the pact ended by the evil spirit receiving in payment the soul of the magician. This is the classical pattern and uh, is found in many old works on demonology. But during the duration of the pact, this demon was forced to serve his master, to do anything that his master wanted him to do. Now, in a great many of these old books, we find a very interesting line of thought, which seems to indicate that the demonism actually did arise from older beliefs. For we learn that these demons that were bound by pacts really had no interest in hurting anybody. They were not out trying to make the magician do evil things. Uh, Mephisto did not have the slightest interest in advancing the whims of Dr. Faust. Mephisto lived in an entirely different kind of world of his own. As the demon, he represented a debonair personality a worldly wise, sophisticated, and attained in all things. To him, Faust was nothing but a, was no one but a child, uh, an infantile ignoramus, perfectly willing to sell his own soul for a few years of glory and a little wealth for the fulfillment of his own desires. And as Mephisto himself tells us, he hasn't the slightest interest in Faust's desires. But because of the pact, he is his servant for the duration of the bargain and must do as he is told. In fact, in a few instances, Mephisto actually intercedes and strongly recommends that Faust not do some of these evil things, which are senseless, meaningless, and purposeless. So in the demonology, it wasn't a case of a demon taking great joy in injuring people. It was a bored demon who had no interest in humanity, who didn't care whether humans lived or died, because he was no part of them, they were not his region, they were not his world. But he had made a bargain, he had signed a contract, he was, uh, uh, so to say, an apprentice to the sorcerer for a while, so he did what he was told and waited patiently until he could inflict final punishment upon the sorcerer himself. This type of diabolism, uh, again, doesn't quite meet uh, the thinking of most people of today. Because here, and this was the typical demonism of the crossroad, where the magic circle was drawn, uh, where the witches of Macbeth brewed their cauldrons, all of this uh, type of medieval uh, tying of spirits, the binding of the powers of nature to the whims of a human being. All of these were based upon a certain uh, power process. Uh, there were secret words, there were secret uh, conjurations, magic circles and terms, rites to be performed. And if the magician was able to perform these correctly, he could command the spirit. And if he could command the spirit, then the spirit had to obey him. And the spirit uh, felt really, as several of the old accounts say, uh, one or two of the spirits do, uh, like Asmodeus in one of the early books, uh, says to the conjurer who has called him out of the misty deep, uh, for some nefarious undertaking, why have you disturbed me? I have no reason to be here. I don't care anything about you. I don't want to hurt anybody. Why have you bothered me? Why have you said these words of power that now force me to obey you because you have the magic 
talismans, the magic symbols. Uh, why, why, why have you done this to me? I don't uh, dislike you. I haven't done anything to you. Why do you insist on binding me to some common human purpose of your own? This was the rather nonchalant idea. It seems to have carried through from the Greek in which these spirits were simply part of the citizenry of an invisible empire and uh, really would never bother anybody if humans left them alone. Now the next uh, phase of the situation takes on a little different coloring. Uh, as the result of the binding of spirits uh, by these conjurations and these magical formulas, it came to be believed uh, that human beings could hurt each other. This was a very late development in the idea of demonology, that human beings should want to use evil forces to afflict each other. This was not part of the original concept at all. Ghosts might haunt those who hurt them in life, but not innocent people. And in most countries, the ghost is a kind of a wavering symbol uh, floating in the atmosphere uh, in graveyards at night or something but not uh, inclined to do anything more uh, than be there, although its presence might frighten some superstitious person out of his wits. But it was not really any particular idea. The concept that either evil wanted to conquer good or could conquer good came late. The idea that man uh, might want to use evil some kind of an invisible or magical evil to hurt other people. This was simply not part of primitive ethics in the majority of instances. It arises occasionally, but is certainly of the exception rather than of the rule. But once we began to believe in witchcraft, once we believed that human beings could make pacts with demons, or could develop within themselves some evil force, could pervert their own nature, natures, and begin to uh, burden us with their perversions, like the witches of Europe riding on their broomsticks to the Sabbath on the Brocken, uh, the, where that human beings themselves voluntarily and of their own inner conviction chose to become evil chose to hurt or destroy other people and sought in long and difficult processes to discover means by means of which they could bewitch or haunt or in some way from a distance plague or hurt um, normal innocent folks. Uh, antiquity had very little room for this concept because it simply did not believe it. Uh, it believed uh, that the uh, so-called spirits could exist. It believed that evil people could do evil deeds. But it simply did not develop any strong concept of black magic as we think of it today. It was outside of the grand concept of life which these people held, and they would not permit something to be believed that did not fit into the great theory of the kind of world they lived in. And with the excep exception of very primitive people, there was no general group in society that believed that the world was created for the purpose of perpetuating evil or that evil had any chance of conquering good in the long, difficult picture of things, even in the Mazdian faith. Evil had no real power uh, to ultimately achieve victory over good. Good was real. Good was deep and great. Evil was passing. Evil was linked so closely to the infirmities of men that it became more and more obvious that most of the evil that we have attributed to demons really arises uh, in the nature of man himself. That we are the creatures who seem to possess 
the strange power uh, of being um, uh, malignant in some way, malicious, malevolent in our conduct towards other people. So in the most part, we come down to comparatively modern times, bringing with us all the grimoires of old, the ancient books of magic and spirits, uh, the pentacles and uh, talismans of Agrippa, of the old book of the keys of Solomon the king. We, uh, we have all these beliefs that have been shadowed down through time. Uh, books that have to do with the creation of an empire of sorcery, a sorcery in which all of the common good of life is threatened and the universe is placed at the disposal of the sorcerer. If he can become wise enough, if he can become strong enough, if he can become skillful enough, there seems to be no limit to what he can do to ordinary, well-intentioned, God-fearing people. This, uh, this concept has lingered on, however, in an extraordinary way. And unless uh, we begin to think it through somewhere, we have to face it more frequently than perhaps we like to really imagine. Uh, even in our uh, most uh, sober moments, we are afraid that somewhere around us Somewhere in space are powers of evil. That these powers of evil operating upon us from the invisible or coming into focus here through persons of evil nature, that these forces can do us great harm. We have also come gradually to lack the marvelous solutions that ancient people had. Most of the time now, the solutions which took care of everything 500 years ago just do not seem to be adequate anymore. We are too smart to believe the solutions, but we are not smart enough not to believe the original idea. In other words, we, we are foolish enough to believe in these evil principles, but not wise enough or not uh, gullible enough to believe in the simple remedies that always took care of them satisfactorily up to recent times. In those long periods in which we were either blessed or cursed by the lack of psychiatrists, these things more or less took care of themselves. Every community had its own local psychiat psychiatrist in the form of an elderly widow or someone of that nature, preferably the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter born with a veil. If we could find her, everything would work out. But how did it work out? Just as it works out in the reservations of Indians down in our New Mexican and Arizona areas today. If you think there is an evil spirit that is trying to do you a little harm, you have to find two stones of a certain shape and size, tie a piece of wool around the stones, and carry them in a little pouch on your, in your pocket or on your body. If you have made this little talisman correctly, you have nothing more to worry about. You're in the clear as far as uh, affliction of that nature is concerned. If you're bewitched, all you have to do is wear your coat inside out for a couple of days, and it's taken care of. These things uh, uh, certainly cause no more trouble. If it's too bad and you just can't handle it yourself, you go to a bruja, which is another witch, and you pay a very reasonable sum for the second witch to bewitch the first one, and then you go home and take and go on with your affairs as always. Uh, there was always such nice, easy ways out. In the medieval period, all you had to do was confess, to do a penance, and be sprinkled on with a little holy water, and the situation was reasonably well in hand. We still have the fears and the worries, but we've lost confidence in the remedy, and that is uh, a, a rather sad state of affairs, because we now have no way of getting ourselves out of these attitudes. Once we get into them, it becomes a deep and involved and troublesome process. 
uh, we, we just uh, are a little less optimistic about how to cure our own infirmities. Perhaps too much de dependence on the professional level of things. The, uh, the point to be very definitely made is this, that as time went on and down into the 20th century, we have a kind of black magic that has drifted along, that has taken on, in some instances, a rather respectable and sophisticated look. Uh, the old uh, sorcerer with his pointed cap and long black robe covered with stars has vanished. Uh, we have now what might almost be termed the mental magician. He has taken the place of all these other things. But we do still believe that people exist who want to hurt us. We also believe that there are certain persons who can hurt us. And whether this hurting is done uh, by means of chaining a demon, or whether it is done by the natural orneriness of the magician himself, makes very little difference to the sufferer. He, re he actually believes that he is in constant psychic or spiritual danger uh, due to the malicious intent of someone else. Now, that this should uh, be a belief is quite understandable. Our so-called uh, level or veneer of uh, sophistication is pretty thin, and beneath the surface of our um, so-called mental advancements and attainments, there is still very much of the primitive and very much of the frightened. Uh, we all live very largely influenced by fear. And fear is a mysterious thing and is most de deadly and most dangerous when the object of that fear is most difficult to isolate or distinguish. Blind fear is the most terrible thing of all because there's no way you can open your eyes for it. It is simply there as a, as a terrible compulsion to terror within yourself. And uh, nothing that man has ever developed in the form of sophistications apparently can touch this basic atavistic anxiety which is within him. So we are all born with it. We all have to struggle with it, and we all have to solve it much as we solve every other problem in life, mostly by common sense, also by building positive beliefs or convictions that are larger than the negative ones. If we would sit down quietly by ourselves, perhaps, and think some of these things through, we would be forced to make decisions. But by the time we are thoroughly frightened, we are in no mood to make decisions. The immediate terror is greater than any judgment that we can be expected to focus on the situation. So the uh, same problem that answers ignorance in every other form must be applicable to this form. The only answer lies in the individual developing within himself positive resources, resources of understanding and insight that simply will not permit him uh, to take on negative and essentially destructive attitudes. And whenever in the history of civilization men have followed strongly after constructive beliefs, Demonism has faded out. Whenever these beliefs were themselves compromised and men fell back again upon their terrors, demonism, demonism increased again. Therefore, we, ha we are reasonably certain that wherever the individual does develop inner resources, he is able to protect himself far, far better from blind fears. I think that in this particular problem, of course, uh, philosophies such as the Platonic philosophy of Greece and the Buddhistic philosophy of India are of the greatest practical help. Because uh, the individual, uh, if he has some kind of a basic philosophy upon which he can lean, 
will have a tendency not to fall so quickly into a completely chaotic and unphilosophic point of view. Uh, most students, for instance, of mysticism, metaphysics, and esoteric sciences and arts in the United States now in this century believe essentially in a universe that is ruled over by proper orderly laws. Most uh, mystics and most of those persons who by nature and temperament might possibly come under the uh, pressure of too much belief in invisible forces in life. Most of these people claim sincerely that they believe in a good God. They claim one of two things, either that God is good, or if they're right materialists, that God does not exist. And if God does not exist, and there is no purpose to the universe, then we have no reason to suppose that evil exists either, because if there is any enduring principle, uh, there is no doubt from all of our observation and reflection for thousands of years that this principle is essentially good. So if we believe, for example, as in uh, Platonism and Buddhism, that this universe is the product of, the, of a divine mind, that this divine mind of itself is inevitably and eternally good, and by the very nature of itself produces out of its own nature only good. Uh, if this universe, therefore, is a product of divine consciousness and is ruled over by just laws, wherein all the heaven and earth of justice is their place, for psychic plaguing of one person by another. Something has to be wrong in the picture somewhere. If a person is subjected to psychic uh, malpractice, which he hasn't earned, which he doesn't deserve, uh, and for which he has no way of protect, protecting himself reasonably, and he must endure this because some other person wishes to take advantage of him. And the one person is not punished for his evil. And the victim is not protected against this evil. What happens to the concept of universal law and order? Well, the answer of the afflicted person usually is that the universe of law and order is a long way off somewhere in space, and the difficulty of the moment is right here. And this is considered to be irrefutable. But the more we think about it, the more we realize there has to be something wrong with the picture. We have to realize that if it were true that uh, by means of the faculties that we are normally endowed with, we are capable of exercising extraordinary malicious influence over other minds. If it is possible for a mind, for good or for ill, to control the life or destiny of another human being, simply because this mind is stronger and the other mind is weaker. And the weaker mind has no defense whatever. We would be in a situation in which the whole world could very well become involved in what might be termed psychic warfare. We would have no out for this situation. In, 19, in the 1940s, there were probably three or four hundred million minds, strong minds, many of them, minds of persons horribly hurt and injured, millions of persons going out like the haunting ghosts of antiquity, with all his hatred headed straight at one man, Adolf Hitler. And yet it took the combined armies of, West, of the Western powers 
to finally bring this man to his end in a bunker in Berlin. He was under the most terrible mental pressure imaginable. I personally know individuals who claim to be well up in magic, who were working night and day to destroy him by magical means. All he did was take on some more territory and take another nation over. Hundreds of millions of minds with just cause for the greatest hatred. Didn't get very far with him. What finally got him was himself. The uh, same might be true of Mussolini. The same was certainly true of Joseph Stalin. The probabilities are that uh, almost as great an amount of hatred was turned against Wilhelm Hohenzollern II, who passed a pleasant and quiet old age in Holland. Why? If a one individual uh, can, by means of mental suggestion, destroy my life or your life, how is it that they can never seem to get the fellow that needs trouble the most? They don't get him. He keeps right on going. And the reason why he almost certainly keeps on going is because he doesn't believe that these other people can do it. He is so sure of himself. Owen Zolan with his me and God. Hitler, the man of destiny. Napoleon, the man of destiny. It was their own arrogance, their own conceit, their own stubborn unwillingness to listen to anyone else that finally destroyed them. But the sorrow, the pain, the agony of minds did not do it. The prayers lifted up against these tyrants did not seem to operate very effectively. And yet we like to assume that these same forces that cannot touch uh, these men, even when augmented several millions of times by concerted thinking, that one lonely um, uh, character of uncertain mind can destroy us. Actually, we have to re-evaluate this entire situation. And it is a little difficult to do because there are things we so desperately want to believe. And there is nothing that we want to believe more than that which we see, that which we hear, and that which, for, uh, which occurs so directly and intimately to us that there seems to be no possible way of evading or avoiding the situation. What we see that have happened seems so factual that we cannot escape it. Now, in the Buddhist philosophy, uh, we have these repentant onis, miscellaneous secondary demons, who more or less finally went to the robe and became good Buddhists themselves. And what do we have as the answer to the rest of the problem in Buddhism? There is one thing, and uh, that is perhaps the most important key to all. There is one legitimate cause for the individual to be in trouble, and that is karma. Now, karma is not a monster. It is a good law absolutely necessary to us. But like the Mio of China and Japan, the ferocious-faced deities were always smiling in a kind of a wicked, uh, sardonic way, as much as to say, I shall have you for breakfast. Uh, this, uh, these Mio, or Fudo Mio, represent karma. They represent the inevitable power of retribution. And uh, to the Eastern way of thinking, karma is this thing which is itself a divine good 
appearing to us in a horrible and destructive and unfortunate and unpopular appearance. In uh, both Platonism and Buddhism, an individual has to be uh, in need of some type of punishment or it doesn't come to him. He has to experience that which he has caused. Let us say, for example, that back somewhere in the Middle Ages, a second or third rate sorcerer appeared who really believed perhaps that he could uh, use these evil forces for his own advantage. Perhaps he didn't use them really for his own advantage. Perhaps he didn't even know whether he did or not. All he knew was that when he prayed that a person would die, that person would sicken and die. And it was obvious, therefore, that his prayers had done it. Uh, we know today that this does not necessarily constitute the answer, but as far as our, mod, our medieval sorcerer is concerned, he may have believed it. So we might assume that all the way down through time, there have been individuals who have sold their souls for wealth, for power, uh, for the fulfillment of their ambitions, and for the fulfillment of their appetites. These individuals have conspired against the public good. They have cheated and stolen and bribed. They have done all kinds of unpleasant things. Perhaps when they did them, they thought it was all right to do them. We've got the whole generation of people now making the most stupid possible mistakes with a very good attitude on the whole thing. I've talked to people recently who have admitted frankly that they see no reason why they should not get the last dollar they can, no matter who they take it from. The problem is now you're respectable if you get the dollar. How is no longer a problem or a question. So people compromise their principles down through time. Some did it in the name of religion, some did it in the name of power, some did it in the name of business, some did it in the name of the learned professions, but they exploited. Uh, they took unfair advantage. They used knowledge and skill to hurt with, and this essentially is black magic. They used the intelligence which they had to enslave other people instead of to free them. They used their scientific skill to make objects and weapons of destruction. And we're producing a lot of them right now. But they took the God-given faculties that man has and have used these faculties to terrorize other people to destroy the securities of living, and to leave this world perhaps a barren sphere in space if someone doesn't come along and straighten out the problem and the tangle. Now, these people, unfortunately, are subject to a law that they don't know anything about, most of them, and that is the law of cause and effect. These individuals have set up compensations. They have set up compensations not merely because they were ignorant, because nature takes ignorance into consideration. They are setting up compensations because they know they are wrong, and yet they prefer to do it that way. Every time we get mad at someone, we know we are wrong, but we keep on doing it. And after a while, we have a thrombosis, which is the way nature catches up with us. When we do what we want to, the world is wonderful. But a thrombosis is sent by the devil. We haven't realized that in many instances, 
The devil, which is merely a form of the deity Fudo or Yama or Mara in India, is the luring flame encircled image of karma. The natural ills that we have done coming back to us. But we remember the words of Mephisto in Faust, when, uh, the, when Faust asks the demon who he is. And Mephisto answers, the spirit of negation, part of the power that still works for good while ever scheming ill. This is karma. In other words, the demon is simply the long way toward the good, the roundabout way through the mistakes that man himself makes. So there is one way in which things can go wrong with us that we cannot explain. Paracelsus, who probably is accredited with knowing more about demons than any other medieval thinker, tells us that there are no miraculous circumstances in life, that a miracle is only the effect the cause of which is unknown, but that cause must be equal to the effect that it produces. So what we term psychic persecution today is an effect. There has to be a cause for it. And where are we going to find the cause? Where in the universe can we find a just cause that something unfortunate should happen to us? The only possible answer is that the just cause has to be ourselves. There has to be a lesson which we must accept. There has to be unfinished business. When this moves in upon us, we can join the Hindus and the Romans and the medieval Christians and the Goths and the Celts in assuming that an evil spirit is bringing it in a pack on his back. But this evil spirit, so-called, is nothing but the retributional aspect of universal law. A good spirit, a saintly spirit, is the spirit of the reward for good. The evil spirit is the spirit. A good spirit, a saintly spirit, is the spirit of the reward for good. The evil spirit is the spirit of the punishment for ill. So nearly all of the infirmities which we would like to shift onto the shoulders of either some uh, actually uh, well-intentioned little demon of one kind or another, or upon some person with malicious intention to us, we have to finally face the fact that in the universe, law and order must be maintained. Now, this does not mean for a moment that another person may not try to hurt us. Let us clearly realize that there are a great many parlor sorcerers, uh, even in this century, There are people who would love to hurt us, perhaps. Not many, fortunately, but some. There are certainly individuals who, disbelieving our principles, are praying to God to punish us. Perhaps they have entirely misunderstood and misjudged us, but we are not receiving any constructive mental influences from them. They believe the worst. And because they believe the worst, they keep on sending to us any negative or perverse thought that might be available. Yet have we any defense against this? How are we going to defend ourselves against persons we don't know, perhaps, certainly whose location we could not uh, find, whom we cannot take into court and charge them with some malicious mischief. Uh, Persons who perhaps we have gradually come to fear with such an intensive terror that it is destroying our own rest and sleep. 
And if we were able to pick up the telephone and say to these persons, are you trying to make life miserable for me? Quite possible the individual would answer yes. I'm doing all I can to make life miserable for you. So here it is. I'm miserable. Somebody else admits they're trying to make me miserable. The circumstantial evidence would almost stand in court. Yet it doesn't have to be true even when it goes that far. Because we are still faced with this, con this constant problem, how are we going to assume any kind of a just existence if another person can make life miserable for us because they want to, and not because there is any justice in it? I think we have to realize that man has been equipped by life with everything necessary to protect him on this dangerous journey which we call existence. Just as surely as he has gradually developed means for the protection of his outer body, as he has developed all that is required to preserve himself as far as possible against almost any creature except his own kind, uh, we realize that man is psychic, uh, well equipped to defend himself. He is psychically set with a keynote of vibration. No two human beings have the same keynote. The discovery of this keynote by any other person is an extremely remote possibility. And even assuming that it could possibly be done, there still remains the problem of the ethical universe in which we live. Uh, from uh, what we can learn from the older philosophical systems, man is capsulated or enclosed in a magnetic field. This field, in turn, is surrounded or held by a mysterious thing called the auric egg. The walls of this egg are stronger than steel, but completely invisible. Against this field, any bacterial organism, anything of this nature, has almost no chance whatever of making any inroad upon man. In fact, nearly always, any individual who suffers from a bacterial or germ infection or contagion does so because primarily the germs are already on the inside of this situation. We are carrying all these in our own bodies, and they are coming out into victorious manifestation because of mistakes that we make in the maintenance of our own economy. If we allow ourselves physically to run down, the germs take over. If we build up, the germs retire. Nature has provided us with a most extraordinary defense mechanism. And this mysterious mechanism extends also into our psychic lives. If we can assume an honest person owing no psychic debt to anyone, uh, living a constructive life, and free from any immediate pressures of karma. If we assume this person, and assume that they are a well-integrated individual, I think we can at the same time assume that so-called malicious psychic persecution is impossible for that person to suffer. Something has to happen to break down the natural defenses of the individual. And these, uh, these breakdowns are the real cause of the whole problem. Somebody who wants to use some mysterious ability to injure us can turn that ability in our direction. But if we are not a proper receiving station, it goes right back to the original sender and causes more trouble than it can ever cause us. Because always the sorcerer 
finally becomes the victim of his own sorcery. He is setting up negative karma in himself, and this karma will destroy him more rapidly than a bullet. So no matter what he wants to do to somebody else, all he can do is destroy himself. The answer as far as this affects us lies in a number of secondary situations which seemingly uh, have a strong bearing on this matter. One of these secondary situations that I'd like to particularly mention is that there seems to be a proven and demonstrable fact of thought transference. In other words, we are unable to disprove and have no desire to disprove. Uh, that the thought of one person can be communicated to another. I think we will find as time goes on that this power will increase with man and that in time it is very possible that the principal form of communication will be by thought transference. Thought transference, however, is only another step beyond radio, television, and the telephone. It began with the telegraph and perhaps smoke signals long, long ago. But when the telephone was invented, we did not have a wave of psychic persecution nor an epidemic of sorcery. Uh, we have not had it uh, with television. We've had several forms of negative thinking, but we haven't had any evidence that the fact that I can pick up a telephone and talk to you is any indication that I can hurt you. At least I can always assume that if you don't like what I have to say, you can hang up the phone. <laughs> also, there is no reason for you to do anything that I say, regardless of what I say. I can look at you and say I am the ghost of the pharaoh Ramesses the Great, and I'm paying ten cents to send this phone call directly from Cairo, and I expect you to do what I tell you to. And in the majority of cases, the receiver will hang up. There is no reason. There is nothing to indicate that thought transference is a legitimate basis of mental persecution. The fact that a thought can get through no more means that the person who receives that thought is vulnerable to some negative force than it would be if he picked up the telephone. Thought transference, it is true, does come into us, uh, perhaps in a rather mysterious way. Sometimes it is not completely obvious how it arrives. We awake in the morning with a sense that we have received a message. Uh, we may perhaps seem to hear it in the air around us. Perhaps it is only a mental impression, and we have a strong feeling that something is happening to a person near us or one with whom uh, we have concern of some nature. Uh, tragedies to loved ones, danger to family and children are very frequent causes of this thought transference, and it is quite frequently associated with the death of a person at a distance. I have gone over hundreds of these stories and records. Uh, they are on file in many groups and appear in many books if you want to spend the long time necessary to dig them out. But I haven't read one account in which this kind of thought transference carried with it any overt moral persuasion to do anything. At the time of the death of Lord Nelson, uh, Lady Hamilton uh, received at the moment of his death the clear impression of his death. She knew that he was dead. But this did not, was not accompanied by any effort on the part of Nelson to indoctrinate her with anything, hurt her, injure her, or over-influence her. It was just the spontaneous pressure of a great desire to communicate. 
Now, most of your thought transference has practically no uh, normal vicious associations. Telepathy is not a proof that one person can hurt another mentally. Even presuming, which is difficult, because usually in cases of telepathy, uh, there is a very strong basic rapport between persons involved. But even presuming that an individual with evil intention was able to send a thought of a destructive nature, it still must pass through the consciousness of the receiving person who has at every step of the way the right to resist it, the right to deny it, the right to declare it invalid and unsound uh, or evil, and therefore to refuse it or to decline it completely. There is no way in which this can be prevented unless, of course, the person who receives it secretly wants to do what this thought implies. But there is very little probability of transmission on this basis anyway because we find always uh, that the necessary rapport is sympathy. Hatred is no ground for sympathy. Evil is no ground for sympathy. There is no sympathy between an evil person and a good person. Therefore, the sensitivity necessary for normal communication simply is absent. In addition to these circumstances, we do know uh, that very often by study that individuals who claim to have been negatively over-influenced have really, actually uh, been induced to do that which they have secretly wanted to do, but which they have not wished to acknowledge that they wanted to do and would prefer to pass the blame on to someone else. If we want to assume for any reason, whatever, that in spite of all these situations, there still appears that we are subject to some kind of negative, destructive force, then I think we should give two areas very definite and complete study and consideration. One is the fact that we are all carrying unfinished karmic business. That it is perfectly possible that at any moment we can stumble over something and fall on our faces. It is perfectly possible that someone will back into us on the road. It is possible at any moment we could have a heart attack. It is also possible that at any moment our business affairs or our various activities in life might be disturbed. It is person perfectly possible that our children will not be sympathetic, that we will have friends alienated, uh, that we will suffer many kinds of personal, psychological, physical, neurological infirmities. These are quite possible. No sorcery is necessary in cases of this kind. And this is particularly true where the individual is introverted, hypersensitive, highly nervous, worrisome, or potentially neurotic. Thus, looking around desperately for an explanation for why something happens to us, it is not necessary to have this other sorcerer somewhere in the background as the probable cause of the trouble. It's not impossible that somebody might like to. There are groups in this country at the present time that are teaching various genteel forms of sorcery. They are teaching all kinds of strange beliefs. Some of them are very secret and very strange. Uh, even in New York at the present time, you can buy in open stores various uh, uh, preparations to be used for magical purposes, to overcome your enemies, uh, to uh, create love filters 
uh, for various reasons or other. And as I think I have mentioned here before, you can buy what is commonly known as the two-pass powders, by means of which you will be guaranteed to throw two sevens in a game of dice. <laughs> These things can be bought today and are sold in great quantities to people who certainly should know better, but never will. It is quite true there are groups, and one of the things that these groups do, which leads to a great deal of trouble, is to bind their followers with oaths and obligations, warning them that if the follower ever leaves the organization or fails to do what he is told, he will be the victim of the most horrible punishments that uh, the most malicious forces will be turned against him, and that he will just be made as miserable as he will permit. Uh, this, uh, this is actually done, and it is done by groups that claim to be overflowing with brotherly love and Christian fraternity. It is also quite possible for an individual who finally leaves such a group and has this in his subconscious, to assume that his difficulties from that time on are due to this persecution. There are also groups that teach various kinds of development exercises and do it all the time, by means of which the natural nervous system can be very seriously uh, disturbed. This the problem can involve a great many different uh, practices which are essentially harmful to the normal function of the body and may consequently set up situations in the nervous system that can lead to exaggerated psychic phenomena, hallucination, and things of this nature. There are also groups that are every day actually teaching uh, various forms of auto-hypnosis assuring the followers that these are advanced courses in yogi, in yoga, when all the individual can ever get of a yogic nature is what he hypnotizes himself into believing that he has got. This is going on every day. And a certain type of individual will always fall for it. When he gets into this miraculous blunderland, in which all common sense is lost, in which everything that might make law and order evaporates, it is perfectly possible and even reasonable that he should begin to suspect the atmosphere to be simply filled with sprites and monsters, that everything around him is filled with maliciousness, because so many of these practices and theories and stories are themselves essentially malicious. Anyone who would curse somebody for leaving a certain organization isn't fit to have an organization, but there's some of them that do. This type of thing causes a great deal of negative anxiety. And when the natural problems of karma step in, this can have a very definite effect upon the individual because it is certain that there's only one kind of karma that is suitable for a person who has tried to over-influence someone else, and that is to believe that somebody else is trying to over-influence him. He has caused sorrow in this area, and it is in this area that he must pay for that mistake. And in one way or another, people are constantly trying to over-influence each other. Therefore, this type of situation is not especially rare. And if it happens to arise from some karmic background in which the original pattern was set down three or four hundred years ago, the person today does not see the justice of it or the value of it or the meaning of it in his present embodiment but he passes through these experiences by which he gradually learns the sacredness of the rights of other people to take care of their own affairs. So out of the 
peculiar juxtaposition of two circumstances. It has come to be assumed that these circumstances are related. It has come to be assumed that the individual who joins some organization for a doubtful reason, coming under some form of unfortunate situation as the result of so joining, then proceeds to suffer from the very conditions which his own consciousness have opened him to. Also, the combination of the fact that gradually he has lost the power to discriminate. He has sold out. And if we sell out to anything, we're in trouble. If we sell out to a political party, the country's in trouble. If we sell out to some theological sect, it may finally uh, compress us and limit us until it destroys our value. Anything that we sell out to will turn on us and hurt us. So we have all kinds of things also that motivate people into various so-called esoteric situations. Probably one of the greatest, the most common of these motivations is simply that the individual is looking for a reason to be alive. These people may be lonely, neurotic people. They are people who desperately want to be important, and to them all kinds of esoteric matters uh, contribute to importance. The individual who has never been able to influence himself correctly will love to influence the rest of humanity. So these people trying to find interest in life, trying to find forgetfulness to their various limitations, trying to get new areas of influence, trying to buy their way into a valuable life, trying to develop powers which will enable them to accomplish mentally what they have no desire to earn physically. All kinds of strange motives, some of them too obscure to be discovered until perhaps long afterwards by the working of karma itself. No human being could discover them. But all of these negative motives all of these unreasonable attitudes, all these sellouts in which the individual compromises his principles for some concept of gain, all these come back. And it looks to the individual that uh, the very uh, persons with whom he has previously worked have turned on him. Perhaps they would like to, but they can get nowhere unless within his own nature he has broken down the patterns of integrity and opened himself to karma. Then the thing he is being punished by is not what the other individual is trying to do to him, but by the compromises which the person himself made by which it might have been reasonable to assume that the other person could have gotten at him. But the individual is haunting himself. He is doing it in a thousand different ways. And his old ego, which has carry, been carried with him for many embodiments, is still struggling uh, to unload its toxic load of karma. And if this load of karma in some time or other uh, meant that we had tyrannized, and in some way we have to experience the, the payment for this, then we shall be the victims of tyranny. Whatever cause we set in motion, if somewhere in long ago we prayed the gods uh, to uh, afflict somebody else, we will sometime awake and think we hear someone else praying the gods to afflict us. I've actually had people come into my office here and ask me if I wouldn't pray for the death of one of their relatives so they could inherit his money. Now, that an individual like that should come finally to believe that somebody else is praying to get rid of them is nothing short of poetic justice. It is not a sign that the bottom is out of the ethical universe. 
It is not a sign there are no laws in nature. And there is not, certainly not a sign that good people can be the victims of bad people. <coughs> Buddhism and Brahmanism and Hinduism all teach that another man can take our body. We can be killed. We can be shot. We can be stabbed. Or we can in time simply die from natural causes. Our physical bodies are vulnerable. They belong to this world and they can be um, uh, taken from us by the various incidents and accidents of life. But to all these systems, this is not important. Actually, the only thing that is important to man is the integrity of his own consciousness. While he is able to keep this, the rest of his fate and destiny are secure. There is nothing else that he need to fear. There is nothing that he can successfully fear. And there is nothing that fear can do for him except make him sick. Therefore, if a person finds themselves in this kind of a situation where they think that they are the victims of some malicious mental force being turned against them, let them always remember certain things that whether such a force exists or not, the fact that we believe that it is doing this to us can do us the greatest harm. Also, most uh, metaphysicians of even the traditional school tell us frankly and firmly, and have said so again and again, that if we change this believing, if we return only good for evil, if we return only strength against weakness, if we reply only in the most constructive way to any seeming circumstance which is incomprehensible to us, we are then, by every level, every count, and every theory, doing the greatest possible good for all situations concerned. In other words, if in the presence of some such a negative thought, we can simply go no further than to say that we still believe that there's somebody trying to hurt us, but that the only answer that we have is to bless that other person and to realize that as far as the universal principle is concerned, this person who might be trying to hurt us should be the object of sympathy. They're the one in trouble, not us. They're the one who are in need of assistance. For the moment, for any reason, we wish to hurt another. We are in the most desperate danger ourselves. Not because of the fact that we are opening our natures to some strange, infernal, traditional punishment, but simply because this type of thinking sets up psychosomatic patterns within ourselves which will destroy our bodies, minds, and hearts. So any individual who is anxious to do evil, desirous of exploiting anyone else for any reason, should be the object of our greatest and deepest sympathy. They are not big, strong people endangering us. They are little, weak people endangering themselves. If we will take this attitude consistently, we will find that they cannot directly or indirectly do any harm to anybody. And the main point is that whether we believe they are doing anything to us or not, and whether in the course of time we discover that the whole thing was our own attitude and not anyone trying to hurt us, regardless of how we want to explain it, our own cheerful, constructive, idealistically, spiritually correct attitude at that time is our greatest protection and our greatest solution. So regardless how we want to explain it, the answer always remains that we must gradually replace fear with faith, that we must lose all interest 
in assuming or believing that anything or anyone wants to injure us or can injure us. Now, this does not mean that we don't have to read the small type in the contract. This does not mean that physically we are not subject to the common laws or the practices of our times. But it does mean that in things relating to spiritual matters and to religious matters, the individual is absolutely safe as long as his own attitudes are absolutely constructive. As long as he knows firmly and completely within himself that he is setting in motion no negative psychic forces, he can be perfectly certain that no one else can hurt him, but most of all, he will not hurt himself. And if this thing, if attitude is really appreciated and really understood, really worked with, there would not be a great deal of black magic in our generation. Because black magic is not just something that another person can practice on us. Black magic is something we can practice on ourselves. Black magic arises the moment we try to solve the problems of our own experience negatively. The moment the individual believes in the reality of evil, he is just as much practicing black magic as the individual who turns the force against someone else, because he is now turning negation against himself, and he is certain ultimately to frighten himself out of his own wits. Now, there are many episodes and incidents described of the raising of spirits on crossroads late at night. And these spirits have been occasionally seen. And any Irishman can tell you they can be seen any time. All you have to be is a good Irishman to see them. <laughs> Therefore, we, uh, we recognize this problem. But I talked to an Irishman who, uh, I don't know whether he was in the right direction from the standpoint of descent or not, but he obviously had kissed the Blarney Stone, not once, but many times. And he, we talked about it one day. He said, yes, Ireland is full of spirits. It's full of all kinds of little creatures that uh, come out of the earth following the plowman. You will see little creatures rising in the mist of dawn, on the mist of evening. And you'll see fairy rings under the trees where the flowers form circles. And you can, you can see them, and you can hear the leprechauns out at night pegging shoes. You can hear them almost any time you want to. And there's one little fellow always sitting with a pot of gold or a crock of gold at the end of a rainbow. Oh, these things, the children see them all the time. Everybody sees them. At least they think they do. So I asked this Irishman once, I said, uh, do these, these little spirits ever bother anybody? Oh, he said, be gone with you. Why should they bother anybody? Of course not. The only time they bother you is when you bother them. If you try to take the leprechaun's crock of gold away from him, he'll work magic on you. And he'll try his best not to let you have it. But if you want to sit down quietly and watch the little folks at play under the trees, they don't mind. They're very happy. In fact, they probably don't know you're there. So he assured me that unless somebody bothered them, they never bothered anybody else. And that's good Scotch folklore, and it's good Irish, and it's good uh, even for the... Uh, rather superstitious folks down on Sicily who have a lot of this type of belief also. But all these things, nobody bothers anybody unless we bother them. And it is the same in nature. The crock of gold at the end of the rainbow might symbolize worldliness and all the mysterious forces that contribute to it. When man is willing to destroy to get that crock of gold, then the spirits that guard it turn upon him. And there's a story in Germany that the still the little Nibelungen people still guard the treasures of the earth. And you have to go to them 
and you can dig the treasure forever, but you'll never find it because they'll always hide it from you. What you have to do is to first of all convince the little people that you have earned it. Then they'll reveal it to you instantly. These are moral fables. There's no question about it. That the treasures of the earth really uh, are guarded in some way. Like happiness and peace of mind and peace of soul. These things are guarded. And perhaps there are little spirits as the Greeks saw them or the Roman Lares and Penates. And these little spirits are the guardians of things to protect man from ever having what he doesn't deserve. And they're, they're wonderfully wise at it. And the man who wants wealth without earning it considers these little spirits demons because they stand between him and what he wants. But everywhere the little people, according to the old legends, are kindly and friendly spirits. And if human beings with so many other superstitions that are not worth anything, would add perhaps one that is worth something, and develop the simple superstition that the air around them and the earth beneath their feet and all the elements in which we live and all the natural resources with which we are surrounded, that all of these things are naturally good. Whether we want to assume they have spirits with them, we don't know. We don't, that isn't important. But that whatever there is is beautiful, is good, and is kindly. And the unknown and the unseen are only the extensions of this. That a thing doesn't suddenly become bad because we can't see it anymore. But that space far out is no more peopled with evil uh, than the glens and the fens of Ireland. That these things are merely the unknown, unconquered universe of realities extending on and on, filled with law, filled with beauty, and filled with good. And if man will keep faith with this good, and he will live harmoniously with it, and will not break the patterns by his own negative psychology and create a negative psychotic condition in himself, he can live on through the years of his life and from life to life in a universe that is essentially good, which has some problems, some unfinished business, in which we are ready to pay our debts, and we are ready to try to do to others as we'd have others do to us, but with it all a great basic faith. And if we have this faith that everything is essentially good in principle, and that in man this principle may be obscured, but it is still basically there. And beyond the selfishness of our daily conduct, there is in every person a spirit that is trying to be good, and that this spirit through karma is ultimately going to win. And little by little, the failings and weaknesses of man will be dissolved by universal law, and in the end, we will all come to that good which was originally ordained for us. If we keep these thoughts in mind and do not permit ourselves to wallow in self-pity, negation, fear, and doubt, uh, we won't have any trouble with black magic. We won't have any trouble with demons. And if by any chance we should meet one somewhere, it will be a very kindly little fellow who will be more amusing than difficult. Because actually, there is no reason why the old Buddhist monk wasn't quite correct when he went by one of these little demons, simply patted it on the head and blessed it. It was all part of a good world. It was all part of a, of a universe of good things. And if the good finds itself strong and rich in our own consciousness, there is nothing else that we need to fear. Well, I think our time is up. Thank you very much.